Chapter 9 Three Ideas So what now? Jean Betancourt asked. She was sitting on a flat, wide rock next to Minos while Acorn stood nearby. All three were gazing at the imposing river that flowed in front of them. Its water was clear, impossibly clear, almost painfully clear, almost invisible. In fact, if not for the sound of rushing water, they might not have known that there was a river there at all. On the river's other bank there hung a silvery mist, obscuring everything, but occasionally thinning in patches, offering a tantalizing glimpse of... and then it was gone. But the bank where the three exiles of hell sat was sunny and warm, grassy, speckled with wildflowers, obscenely pastoral and picturesque, menacingly peaceful. Neither Minos nor Acorn answered Jean's question. All three of them needed this moment of rest after Acorn's frantic gallop away from Dirk, through the forest of hell, books still held in Acorn's teeth, plunging deeper into it until they were enveloped in a darkness beyond darkness, not just an absence of light, but a thing in and of itself, darkness with a capital D, that stretched on in a way that defied time, space, direction, and then out of it again, bursting through, being reborn, emerging on a seashore, coming out of the ocean, but not wet, unbaptized, onto the beach, the sand turned to molten glass beneath each strike of acorn's hooves, still hurtling forward, unstoppable, galloping, flying over the beach, reaching a mountain, steep and rocky, unclimbable. But acorn climbed it, finding hidden paths, or else moving the rocks out of his way by willpower alone, or else the mountain itself shifting of its own will to allow the pony to climb it, respecting his motion, forever forward, and now up, anticipation, not of death, still forward, still up, up towards an unseen peak, shrouded in clouds, up, forward, the cat and the woman clinging to this monster, this machine, up, forward, monstrous machine, through the clouds, now seeing the sun for the first time, into a forest, but how could a forest be this high up, they thought. Through the forest, still climbing, but not a forest like that bleached skeletal mockery of hell, but a forest of green and brown, still silent, but a silence of anticipation, not of death, still forward, still up, the grass scorching as Acorn ran over it, the flowers springing out of the ground behind the pony once he had passed, a trail in inverse, a testament to his journey, until the whole forest was blooming, sprouting, growing around them, the sound of wood creaking and straining as Acorn swept past it, bringing a sudden burst of time to this timeless place, giving it that modifying spark that it had so long needed, but Acorn didn't stop, couldn't stop to appreciate the consequences of his own being, because he was still moving, forward, up, until the trees began to thin, until he reached a bright meadow, sunny and warm, getting nearer, or so it seemed, only Acorn knew, further up, always up, the light of the sun above him, not a thing in and of itself, but an absence of darkness, and what a merciful absence it was, the field stretching on, Acorn galloping forward until he saw a river, and then Acorn stopped. They had escaped. Minos immediately jumped off Acorn's back, landing lightly on the ground, and began grooming himself. Jean Betancourt followed suit, the, uh, the jumping off Acorn, that is, not the grooming part. Betancourt took a deep breath of this living air and took a few steps toward the preternatural stream. She noted the fact that Acorn did not drink from it, even though he was still panting from exertion after his impossible run. She peered at the other bank of the river and saw nothing but a silvery mist, obscuring everything, but occasionally thinning in patches, offering a tantalizing glimpse of... The author sat on a wide, flat rock that overlooked the river, and Minos jumped up to join her. Acorn stood nearby. Jean Betancourt asked, So now what? Time has a tendency to become palindromic in this place. Now the two of you do what you meant to do, Acorn said, his speech muffled by the thin book he still held between his mighty teeth. He trotted around the boulder to face the woman and the cat and dropped the book on the ground in the middle of the newly formed triangle. We're going to judge. Pam, Pawnee, and Dirk all looked at Anna blankly. You're dyslexic, Dirk finally said. Top of page 11, Anna said triumphantly. Anna is dyslexic, so reading and writing are difficult for her. I would tell you to check for yourself, but if I recall, you're distinctly bookless at the moment. Okay, fine, sure, Dirk said. Congratulations on your developmental disorder. Mazel tov. But how is that in any way relevant to this situation? 
Christ, an aside. For someone who's so fond of throwing Derrida around at every opportunity, you're not very quick on the uptake here. All theory, no practice, I suppose. Oh, Dirk said quietly. And there it is, Anna said. She looked at her friends and pointed at Dirk. See that, girls? That's the face of someone who just realized exactly how deep in the shit he is. Jesus, Anna, stop being smug and just tell us what the fuck is happening, Pawnee said. She's deconstructing reality, Dirk explained to the Indianan city. Literally deconstructing it. In the world of a text, dyslexia must be like not even a superpower. More than that, it's like having all the cheat codes. The building blocks of this world are words, and words are less stable to her than they are to us. She can take the words slash world apart, mix up the pieces, flip them around, recombine them, and then put them back into places she sees fit. Decontextualize, then recontextualize the text. Context itself is meaningless to her. Her very existence is not contextual, but contextual, working against the text, am I right? Anna shrugged. Yeah, more or less. I would have phrased it more like it means I can fuck shit up like no other, but I guess that's the difference between us. <laughs> oh, sorry. The difference between us. That's, uh, that's a good pun, Dirk begrudgingly admitted. Thank you, Anna said. Pawnee and Pam high-fived behind her back. And the best part is, I never would have realized that I have this power if he hadn't killed me. Like I said, when you sent me to the other side of the other side, I passed through all the texts surrounding this one, but I didn't go smoothly. My dyslexia made them rough, I guess, more textured, as you'd probably like to put it. The words that build them are more mutable to me, and I kept getting caught on their jagged edges, edges that would be invisible to you that you couldn't factor for, and so I became aware of the existence of these other texts. When I landed back in this text, having been nudged slightly off course by those collisions, I became aware of it. I was a half-step out of sync with reality, existing partially between its very words. I imagine anyone else would have just slotted back into place and continued on the path he would set for them. But, being dyslexic, I was uniquely equipped to recognize these blurry, mixed-up, in-between spaces. I kept one foot in the text, playing along, but all the while learning about it. Learning about myself, finding its weaknesses, searching for its seams. And I found the seams. So it seems... Dirk mumbled to himself, unable to resist. That's not all, Anna continued. Passing through these other texts awoke another power in me, even more significant than the dyslexia. The other texts, Dirk interrupted. The metaphorical gears that were frantically spinning in his head apparently needed some more lubrication. You keep talking about other texts around in this one, but what are they? Is it some kind of bookshelf metaphor? Are they the other Pony Pal books, or... The gears were squeaking more and more loudly. You just love your little illusions, don't you, Dirk? Anna said. Gotta make sure everybody knows how well read you are. God forbid someone think you don't have any Baudelaire memorized, right? Fuck. C'est que notre âme est là, n'est pas assez zardi, Pam whispered. I didn't know you spoke French, Pawnee whispered back. I don't. It seems like you figured it out already, Anna said. But for the sake of my chatty friends behind me, I'll spell it out. I passed through everything. Every poem, every novel, every essay that you quoted or paraphrased or just plain stole from. And as I passed through, little bits of them got stuck in me like splinters. And now you can commune with them or channel them or become them, Dirk said. Anna shrugged. Again, more or less right. I don't know exactly how it works, but I do know that it's not the text themselves. It's the characters. She tapped her head. I've got a couple hundred guests in here with me now. Some of them are totally useless. Fucking proof rock, am I right? And some are downright holding me back, looking at you, underground man. But you were also kind enough to give me a couple aces in the hole. Claudius, who you gave me just a few minutes ago with your dumb nutshell joke, thanks for that, is a son of a bitch, but he gets shit done. Lenore gets power from absence, which is a little tricky to apply, but pretty damn useful once you figure it out. John Shade and company are a mixed bag. I'll, I'll leave it at that, lest the poor king and that bigger, more respectable, more competent glassmaker slither their way in here. Hell, speaking of mixed bags, the entire goddamn Bible. Okay, we get it, Dirk said. Jesus. Which, just to be clear, is being used as a profanity, not a reference to any work of literature, past, present, or future, in which Jesus is a character. But what's most important now, Anna continued, is that ridiculous Dante interlude you shoehorned in. I can't say I'm at all surprised that you're a fan of the most famous self-insert fan fiction in the traditional Western canon, but this one's a little different. You didn't just mention the Divine Comedy, you structured part of the story after it. And you should know better than anyone how important structure is. You made Acorn into your Dante, 
and Minos your Virgil, which is a little confusing because Minos is already a character in the Inferno, playing his traditional mythological role as the one who judges the damned and assigns them a spot in hell, and your cat Minos is also playing that role. But the point is that there's one role you left conspicuously unfilled. Beatrice, Dirk said quietly. Damn straight. The figure who knows of hell but who dwells in heaven. How very like you to focus on the angsty, moping dudes while ignoring the woman who's really pulling all the strings. By the way, just FYI, literally every single work you alluded to in this dumb story was written by a man, all of them. Which is pretty fucked up, really, I'm just saying. You might want to have a hard think about that. <clears throat> Anyway, by killing me, albeit temporarily, you made me a perfect fit for the part of Beatrice, existing in the spaces in between. Now, in the Divine Comedy, Beatrice sees Dante being chased by wild animals, so she orders Virgil to lead him to her. So, by analog, I gave you power over me, no, Stirk finished. That's right. But due to your sloppiness with the structure of your references, I not only got control of Dante Minos, I also became the commander of the version of Minos who is the judge of the dead. And I don't think that you're exactly eager to be judged by me, am I right? Dirk was drumming the fingers of his left hand on the side of his leg. I follow you so far, he said. But how do you know all this? All the exact details of it, I mean. All those characters that you absorbed became whatever. They, and your DSX dyslexia, gave you this power, but who gave you the overarching knowledge of the structure in which the power operates? You did, Dirk, Anna said. As skeevy as it sounds, I've got a little splinter of you in my head right now, which raises several very interesting and concerning implications, first and foremost of which you see yourself as a literary character. Well, I'm here in this fucking book, aren't I? Dirk said, waving his arms around. If that doesn't make me a literary character... Anna shook her head, the motion causing another trickle of the mysterious fluid to drip from her shoulder. No, that's just a version of you on the inside, in this text. I needed to pass through a version of you in order to absorb it, necessarily putting it outside the text. You, in your life outside this book, frame your existence as literary. Is it because you want your life to be poetic? You want whatever tragedy there is in it to be dramatic and orderly and cathartic because you think that'll give it purpose, meaning? Does thinking of yourself as a character in a story make you sleep easier at night? After all, if everyone else is just a character too, then you're justified in your complete inability to make genuine connections with them. Or do you actually believe that there's an author figure controlling your life? Because that would be at best incredibly vain, and at worst, a symptom of psychosis. Fine, you've got me all figured out. Congrats, you and the Freudy, which is a gold statue of a couch with a figure of a sad little man who looks like me lying on it. The award ceremony's in September. Start writing your speech. I'll be sure to thank the Academy, Anna said. You say we're going to judge, Mino said, but I get the feeling, Acorn, that you aren't the one we'll be judging this time. The structure has been turned inside out, Betancourt said, quick on the uptake. The intent of the narrative was for Acorn to be judged, but now you, we, will judge the narrative itself, returning its own rules against it. Acorn nodded. Yes, the three of us will review the evidence and decide whether this book should have ever been. That's why I brought us here. It's both thematically appropriate and, dependent on our verdict, will be an efficient and poetic mechanism to carry out our justice. In this place is, Minos prompted, it's the eighth and highest layer of purgatory, Acorn said. Terrestrial paradise. Dirk modeled his Inferno after Dante's, so it only makes sense that the poet's other two volumes are equally represented. Welcome to Canto 31 of Purgatorio. It's so much better to be able to flat out explain these things, Jean said appreciatively. No more of that opaque tee-hee, do you get my obscure reference nonsense? Acorn and Minos nodded. Acorn continued. Damn fucking straight. And here's some more explanation for you. In the Divine Comedy, Dante indeed includes the five classical rivers that Dirk mentioned on page 45, but they're arranged a bit differently than they are in the Greek tradition, which uh, Dirk would have known if he'd researched the content of the poem instead of just its form. Instead of being spread willy-nilly through the underworld, each has a specific place and function. The Acheron is the outmost border of hell. Styx is in the fifth circle, with the Wrathful. The Phlegathon is a boiling river of blood in the seventh circle that's guarded by centaurs. Sounds like the cover of a death metal album, am I right? And the Cockatus is in the ninth circle, where it forms a frozen lake that holds Satan himself. The fifth river, though, isn't in hell at all. It's right here, in Purgatory. It's the last barrier that pure souls cross before they can enter heaven. They drink from it and forget all their earthly sins. Lethe, Betancourt whispered, looking with awe and fear at the river in front of them. 
Thematically appropriate indeed, Mino said approvingly. Did Anna explain all this to you? Betancourt asked Acorn. Yeah, Acorn said. Oh, I should have mentioned, she's Beatrice now. Metaphorically, at least. I don't really get all of it, but she also told me that she and the other girls are working on their own plan in tandem with ours. They're trying to fix all of this bullshit, too. There are things a bit different, but if either one succeeds, we'll be able to be free of this damn thing. He prodded at the book on the ground with his hoof, once and for all. All three of them looked at the thin paperback on the ground, a pile of wood pulp slurry and cheap ink that had somehow become the force that ruled all their lives. There was a moment of apprehension. Was this thing, this dead thing they stared at, sacred, or was it profane? And was there any difference? Jean Betancourt picked the book up. Let's figure this out, she said. She opened it to the first page. Now, Anna said resolutely, I think we've thoroughly explained all the how that's going on here. Time to move on to the what. Namely, what we're going to do to fix this mess. Hang on, Pawnee said. I think that you owe me and Pam some of our own what's too. Like, what the fuck is this book world you're suddenly telling us that we're living in? That would be a good place to start. A gift said Pam dreamily. Pawnee gestured wildly at the girl, flailing her arms, making the universal sign for this! Fucking look at this! Also, she shouted at Anna, you can tell us what the fuck is going on with Pam. All this vague, creepy prophet shit is seriously weirding me out, and simultaneously making me feel like I'm the asshole for not instantly and magically understanding everything. Anna nodded. Yes, I do owe both of you that. In an instant, the trickle of the mysterious, shimmering fluid dripping from Anna's left shoulder turned into a torrent. A blast of radiance had hit the ground and then reflected straight up, growing stronger and wider and brighter, until all three of the Pony Pals were engulfed by a column of the... Light? The liquid? Light? It was... She was... Was... Oh. Now I understand. Of course I can't describe it. The light is, or represents, a... Uh, a barrier that I can't narrate through. Narrate from Narare to relate, but also Naris to know. And I don't know. I can't know this. I'm uh, figuratively and uh, quasi-literally in the dark. If Anna was developing this power all along, or at least since she died, then that's how... That's how I was able to avoid detection, Anna interrupted, as the light that surrounded her and her friends faded. I guess there's at least one more how, after all. How I stayed out of your sight while I started to semi-unconsciously make the story veer off course. I mean, if anyone was going to notice a few words out of place, it'd have to be someone as anal and controlling as you. Thanks, said Dirk, only half sarcastically. It was small things at first, things that didn't even matter. On page 36, you wrote me drinking whiskey. I changed it to brandy. Again, I'd tell you to check, but... Anna made a small gesture that conveyed the sentiment, but my god pony stole your meta-recursive book and ran away with it. Anna was very good at gestures. Eventually, Anna continued, I started slightly revising entire lines of dialogue. Speech was harder to change than the rest, but I managed. And my influence gave Pawnee and Pam some wiggle room, and they started slightly diverging from your plan, too. Just some synonym replacement here and there, but it mattered. Because once my friends and I got a taste of that free will, even if we weren't aware of it as such, we became powerful enough to completely disrupt the narrative, rather, your narrative, the fake one, on page 54. Pam opened her mouth as if to speak, but hesitated. Her brain gears were apparently shifting into overdrive, too. And your arm... thing? Dirk asked, obviously frustrated that he couldn't be more precise with his words. Oh, right, that, Anna said, glancing at her shoulder. I think it's some sort of manifestation of the parts of the original story that you have faced. It's an echo in this reality of the arm that I was supposed to still have, and, synecdochically, of all the text that you covered up. Therefore, you can only see and describe the faintest trace of it. Makes sense to me, Dirk said. Also, synecdochically is a good word. Everyone gathered in the hellish clearing nodded in agreement. After their shared moment of logophilia, also a good word, Anna glanced at the other three and asked, So are we good now? Can we move on? Yeah, let's, Dirk said. The logic of everything is still fuzzy in places, but we've been doing nothing but stand here explaining things to each other for what feels like hours. No action at all, just talking heads. Super boring. The narrative perked up its metaphorical ears. You know what? It thought to itself. He's right. This is really boring. And the stuff with Acorn's group is pretty much just standing and talking, too. Now, I know I said earlier that I wasn't relevant and wouldn't go off on my own again, but... <sighs> the narrative squirmed like a worried ferret. Then it started to squirm even harder, worked up by self-satisfaction at the callback it had just made to page 49. But what the hell, am I right? Let's check on something more dynamic. Then we'll come back here, I promise. The narrative giggled. Then popped out of Dirk's head and dashed away, scampering on tiny little dactylic feet.
which is still a good pun, even if it had already been used on page 53. Tell me where the bomb is, you bastard, Dr. Crandall shouted, slamming his fist down onto the lid of the antique grand piano. Brandy, the World War I year German soldier, spat a mouthful of blood onto the faded Persian rug. Never! he cried in a gurgling scream. Another gust of bone-chilling, snow-pregnant wind blasted them, howling in through the broken French window. The enormous crystal chandelier above the two men swayed wildly, but even more chilling than the wind, even more dangerous than the unstable Chekhov chandelier were the men's glares. They paced in a slow circle around the grand lobby of this abandoned ski lodge, both keeping their pistols leveled squarely at the center of the other's chest. Only one of the pistols was loaded. It's over, Brandy, the doctor bellowed over the wind. Can't you see that you've lost? I've already released the hostages, and... He stepped over the body of the panther that still lay sprawled on the ground. And I've found the sacred katana. Just tell me how to disarm the bomb and I'll let you live. Brandy laughed a joyless laugh as he grabbed the last Fabergé egg off the billiard table and hurled it out the window. It was instantly consumed by the blizzard. Dr. Crandall winced. Even if I know where it is, Brandy said, his accent thick, what makes you think I know how to disarm it? His limp was getting more pronounced by the minute. Quinn's rock to A4, he yelled as another strong gust of wind made the chandelier swing even more erratically. Bishop to A4, Dr. Crandall immediately countered, inching closer to Brandy. Check. The orphans watching from the second floor balcony gasped and huddled closer together, clutching the black leather briefcase as if their lives depended on it. And they did. A sly grin spread across Brandy's face. Good head, doctor he said, also drawing in closer. I knew I could count on you. King to D7, check. Now it was Dr. Crandall who laughed, moving closer still, until the two men were inches apart. I knew you'd know that, and knowing that you know, I knew that you'd be so eager to lure me into your trap that you'd get careless. Pawn to C6. They now stood nose to nose, each man's gun pressing directly against the other's chest. Checkmate. We both always knew it would end this way, didn't we? Brandy said, barely whispering. Yes, we did. Dr. Crandall whispered back, I'm sorry, brother. The chandelier's chain snapped. Both men pulled the trigger. God damn it, what did I say last time? Dirk yelled to the narrative. Stay over here and fucking behave yourself. Christ! The narrative hung its head abashedly and crept back towards Dirk, leaving the abandoned ski lodge and its story to be forever unfinished. I don't know where you were, Dirk said to the disobedient narrative, but wherever it was, I'm sure it was less interesting than what's happening here. The narrative settled back into Dirk's head with a resentful grumble. Can I ask my fucking question now, Pawnee said, or do I need to sit through more of your horseshit first? Sorry, I think I've got it under control now, Dirk said. Just gotta keep a tighter leash on this thing. It's dangerous to give stuff like that too much autonomy. <laughs> Trust me, I know. Ignore him, Anna said. Just go ahead and ask me. Pawnee took a deep breath and all but shouted, Who the fuck is my real father? Oh yeah, Dirk said, perking up. I almost forgot about that subplot. I can actually answer that one for you. Nobody. Or I guess whoever I said it was the first time. Ron Swanson, right? But there was no big oracular reveal planned. No mystery to be solved. I know who your real father is it was just a silly overdramatic one-liner, a throwaway joke, like almost everything else about your character. Wait, shit, that came out wrong. I mean, I know his name, Pam said abruptly. I don't know how I know it, but I do. Pawnee turned to face Pam. Tell me, she said. I need to know. All right, Pam said. Your real father's name is... Cliffhanger, Dirk whispered hopefully. Anna shushed him. Mr. Sanders, the naturalist, Pam said. Silence. Not a pregnant silence, or a shocked silence, or an anticipatory silence. Just a flat, thudding silence. The kind of silence that happens when a stage actor forgets a cue line, or when two old friends discover that they no longer have anything in common, or when children at a birthday party break open a piñata, and it turns out there isn't any candy inside, just, for some inexplicable reason, dozens of ballpoint pens. Which isn't bad, really, because they're pretty nice pens, but at the same time it's a little disappointing, because the kids reasonably expect candy, so, you know. Uh... It was a silence as if the whole world was saying, Oh. Oh, said Pawnee, who's, who's Mr. Sanders? I have no fucking idea, said Pam. He's your father, Pawnee, Anna said, gently putting her hand on Pawnee's shoulder. Pawnee shrugged it off. He went to faraway places to study animals like elephants and monkeys. Lulu's mother died when Lulu was four years old. Lulu, Pawnee interrupted. That woman who left with Acorn called me Lulu, too. Who is that? 
It's you, Pawnee, Anna said. Or the you in the original story. After that, Lulu's father took Lulu on his animal trips. When she turned ten, her father decided that Lulu should live in one place for a while. That's when she came to Wiggins to stay with her grandmother. What? No, Pawnee said, recoiling from Anna. My mother didn't die. She eloped with Joe Biden. And I didn't go on animal trips. I lived with Greg Daniels and Michael Schur. And I'm not a girl named Lulu. I'm the goddamn city of Pawnee, Indiana. Pam furrowed her brow. That, that doesn't sound quite right. Exactly, Anna said, excitedly, because it makes no fucking sense. Pawnee, you were supposed to be a normal girl. Population one. I mean, how the fuck can someone even be simultaneously a city and a girl anyway? It's literally nonsensical. And it's all because, she jabbed an accusatory finger towards Dirk, of him. Like I explained to you earlier, we're all the product of two stories, a primary one written by Gene Betancourt and an overlaid one written by him. Lulu is who you were in Betancourt's book, but his rewrite changed you into Pawnee, Indiana. Thanks to his meddling, your whole past, your whole identity has been replaced. You're not a city. Your father isn't Ron Swanson, and all your memories before we found that cat aren't real. Pawnee was clutching her head, reeling in shock. Can you blame her? She just got some really fucking heavy news. I think we can all understand if she needs to sit the next few paragraphs out while she deals with this stuff. Hang on, Pam said to Anna, while Pawnee staggered over to a tree and leaned against it. Her memories aren't real? But Anna, are our memories any more real than hers? If we're characters in a book like you explained to us while we were hidden by your uh, arm juice light thingy, then how are we different from Pawnee? We're all just assembled fictions. Okay, yes, Anna said. But most of our memories and personalities are from the real text, the original one, the right one. But that's what I'm saying, Pam replied as Pawnee slumped to the ground. Why is that text right? It's the original one, sure, but why does originality have any moral value attached to it? And really, Dirk interjected, breaking his spectatorial silence, one can argue that while Betancourt's text is original, mine has more originality. There are literally hundreds of children's books about ponies and horses and other such equine falderall. But how many books can you think of in which one of those ponies chats the demonic cat about cephalophores, scripture, and Dostoevsky novels? That shit ain't in Black Beauty, I promise you that. Stop trying to confuse us, Anna snapped at him. Pam, do you not feel it? That this isn't who we're supposed to be? How we're supposed to be? Who cares about supposed to, Pam said. It's how we are. Anna's right, Dirk said calmly. This world is wrong. It's rough and sleazy and ridiculous. But the world that it used to be was saccharine and sterilized and flat. It was a world of innocence, yes, but also of ignorance. I didn't just change it. I improved it. No, Anna said as she slowly turned to face Dirk. No, don't you fucking stand there and tell me that you honestly think this is better. Dirk shrugged. It's more interesting. Don't you agree, Pam? Stop trying to turn us against each other, Anna yelled. Look at Pawnee. I would be pointing at her, but you fucking made me saw off my own left arm. How dare you say that Pawnee is better off? She's miserable. She doesn't know her real family. She has no stable concept of self because she thinks she's a city, and she's an alcoholic. She has a serious problem, Dirk. You keep using that phrase as a callback joke, but it's not fucking funny. And the worst part is, we couldn't help her. You forced me and Pam to stand by and watch while Pawnee destroyed herself. I mean, what kind of friends would see that and not try to help? Pretty awful fucking friends, that's who. Dirk was starting to look uncomfortable again. Maybe Pam's right, Anna said to Dirk. Maybe your version of our story isn't ontologically or metaphysically wrong, but it sure as hell morally wrong. Pawnee unsteadily rose to her feet, having apparently jerry-rigged her ego back together with twine and duct tape after it had been blasted apart by Anna. Pam rushed to Pawnee's side, ostensibly to help steady her, but also because she was frightened. Anna was changing, charging, reverting to that chilling supernatural state beyond humanity. It is wrong, Anna continued, and we, all of us in this story, have been wronged by you. And wrongs must be redressed, Dirk said, calmer now. Another moment of absolute silence in the clearing. The diaphanous light began to pour from Anna's shoulder again, but this time, instead of falling onto the ground as a liquid, it began to consolidate into a physical form. Yes, they must, Anna said, taking a step toward Dirk. The light shifted and churned, finally resolving into its new solid form. It was an arm, a silver, shimmering arm made of pure light. The arm held a sword. Anna continued advancing. Dirk stood motionless. You put all of us through hell, Anna said, both figuratively and literally. We were supposed to be the Pony Pals, three friends who like to ride their fucking horses down the Pony Pal Trail and don't even realize what a stupid name Pony Pal Trail is. But instead, we're the Pony Pals who guzzle liquor and carry harpoon guns and sacrifice animals to dark gods and frame our teacher for arson. 
She kept slowly walking forward. This is not right. That is not right. And you had no right to make it such. Anna was now standing directly in front of Dirk, her face a stony mask. Electricity, terror, power. Anna raised the sword in her ethereal left hand. The sword and the hand that were the embodiment of all the innocence that had been forever lost. A blade of erased possibility. Pawnee looked away. Pam didn't. Dirk lowered his head, presenting the back of his neck. Anna swung the blade. But then she stopped. The blade hovered inches above Dirk's neck. He peered up at Anna questioningly, expectantly. No, Anna said quietly, her eyes wide. This isn't what I want. Her left arm and the sword it held instantly evaporated in a flash of white light. Anna stumbled backward, the unearthly power draining from her. This isn't what I want. So who does want it? She gasped and looked at Dirk with pure disgust. How long were you planning this? She hissed. Dirk raised his head and rubbed the back of his neck with one hand. What are you talking about? He asked Anna. He glanced at Pam and Pawnee, who both gave him I-don't-fucking-know shrugs. What was it? Some sort of emergency escape plan? A tertiary backup for your backup? Anna said accusingly. But if that's the case, you would have had to anticipate... So much. She gave Dirk a piercing stare. Just how in control of all this are you? Seriously, Dirk said, raising his hands in surrender. I have no idea what you're referring to. You're the dyslexic uber being here. You're going to have to help me out a little. Minos, Anna said. The reference to Daedalus on page 12. Even that word you used a minute ago. Redressed. It's all been setting up a metaphor that's simultaneously another one of your illusions. Indulge me, Dirk. What's the etymology of redress? From French, Dirk said automatically. Re again. Dressier to straighten. What are you getting at? To straighten again, exactly. And what needs to be straightened, Anna asked, rhetorically? A labyrinth. Ah, said Dirk, clever. This entire book that you wrote, this tangle of orange with all its absurd twists and double backs and dead ends, is the labyrinth you constructed, Anna said. But you aren't Minos or Daedalus in the metaphor. You built this labyrinth from the inside, to hold yourself. You're the Minotaur. Very clever, Dirk said approvingly. And having built the illusion into this story as such, you knew I'd have the splinters of its characters inside me, Anna continued. So you goaded me into thinking you were the enemy of Crete, devourer of innocent Athenian youths. You handed me the sword of Aegis and pointed me towards yourself. You wanted me to be Theseus. Christ, Pam whispered. If that was my plan, Dirk said, with a small smile, which I still maintain that it wasn't, you'd have to admit that it was a good one, my own character killing me to erase my own influence from herself. I have no idea what that would do to the story, but I'm willing to bet there would be some fireworks. But I won't do it, Anna said. I won't act out your fucked up masochistic fantasy. Sparing my life, Dirk said. How noble of you. A lenient judgment. You misunderstand, Anna said coldly. This isn't leniency, and it's certainly not mercy. You'll still get your metaphor, but I'm going to invert it. Turn it inside out. Dirk chuckled. Inside out. There's that phrase again. So clinical. Inside out. A self-satisfied smile. And that, Jean Betancourt, is good Leitwurstel. Anna ignored him. You still get to be the Minotaur, she said, and this book is fucking certainly still your labyrinth. But I refuse the role of Theseus. Instead, I'm going to be Ariadne. But she'll be inverted, too. I won't give you a string to lead you out of the labyrinth. No, I'm going to use that string to entrap you even further. I'll inscribe you into the labyrinth, into the text itself. Here's some fucking wordplay for you. Plot thread, spinning a yarn, to weave a tail, all culminating in the creation of, you'll appreciate this, a textile. Bravo, Dirk said warmly. I'm impressed, and I do appreciate it. Just one request before you imprison me in this metaphor. Minotaur is so crass. I prefer Asterion. Ironically, Anna asked. Of course. Aren't you going to try to change my mind, Anna asked? It doesn't seem like you to just give up like that, to relinquish control. I don't know how much control I haven't had to begin with, Dirk said. Besides, isn't it good that I'm not acting like I usually do? That shows that I've grown as a character, right? It would if you did it sincerely, Anna said. But the fact that you just said as a character instead of as a person makes me question your motives. Yeah, I guess you're right, Dirk said, sitting down in the snow with a sigh. Maybe I'm just tired, worn thin. I don't know. What do you think? I think you're sad, Anna told him, and lonely. I think you can't admit it without burying it under twenty layers of metafiction and pretension and irony. You want this book to be cathartic, right? That's what you wrote in your outlines. This should be a tough, emotionally draining read, but cathartic in all the worst ways. Cathartic for whom? The reader or you? 
Would it be vain to propose that it be cathartic for the reader through me? Dirk asked. After all, isn't all fiction autobiographical? Or perhaps more precisely, autobibliographical? Because what is the bio if not a transcribed biblio, a bibliography incarnate, or maybe incarnalized, a carnal codex encoded in incarnadine ink, but soon to necrotize into a charnel charter, a disembodied de-inscribed spirit, a shaded shade, channeled by a medium, through media, intermedial, the channel branching into snies, which return us to the river's source, which is, of course, the sign, that single signal. You know what would be really cathartic? Anna interrupted. If you dropped all the meta bullshit and masturbatory word games, if you stopped hiding behind them, if you could just make one sincere effort at reaching out to the other human being reading this without using quotation marks or a Dirk said to separate yourself from this character, if you could be honest and straightforward and candid for once in your damn life and just communicate. I... I... I can't, Dirk said. I didn't think so, said Anna, and that's why you can't stay here. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then Dirk was gone. Well, shit, said Pam. That was less dramatic than I thought it'd be. Anna shrugged. Yeah, I didn't want to make a big thing out of it. No need for any the rest is silence bullshit, you know? Yeah, Pawnee said. She glanced around. So, now what? Now, Anna replied, we begin Operation Palimpsest. Operation Palimpsest. And that's where it ends, Jean Betancourt said. It's just blank paper pasted onto the pages after that. Except now it has me saying, Operation Palimpsest, and that's where it ends. And now that's where it ends. So it looks like it's working under standard magical book rules. Now that we're caught up, it's recording everything we say and do a few moments after we say and do it. So no cheating by skipping ahead. Jean Betancourt closed the book, then quickly opened it again and read out loud. Jean Betancourt closed the book, then quickly opened it again and read out loud. Jean Betancourt, satisfied, she shut it again and carefully placed it back on the ground between herself, Acorn, and Minos. There was no sound but the menacing, wordless babble of the Lethe. Minos stood and stretched. I suppose we should formulate our three ideas now. That's the title of this chapter, after all. And it's almost over, so we'd better have our ideas before... Detective Pony was originally written by Jean Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Jean Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.